This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London and here's what's coming up on today's programme. Fed officials tow a hawkish line saying inflation is not yet beaten. Some investors are now betting on a terminal rate as high as 6%. Credit Suisse shares fall as clients pull a record amount of money in the fourth quarter. The Swiss lender posts its biggest annual loss since the global financial crisis. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is in Brussels today after surprise visits to the UK and France. We are live on the ground all morning. Let's check in on these markets. Our top headline around that hawkish commentary from Fed officials. Markets looking past that, though. You've got inflation data out of Germany looking a little bit more benign, dropping to a five-month low. And then, of course, you have an earnings picture and a number of stories that are reflecting upside. If you look at the likes of Siemens and the trading business of Credit Agricole, we'll break down those corporate stories for you shortly. But it is risk on. You're seeing the dollar softer. You're seeing moves into some of the debt in Europe, gilts and buns, and we'll check in on those shortly. Across the futures then, NASDAQ futures pointing to gains of nine-tenths of a percent after the losses of yesterday. Euro dollar, the single currency gaining four tenths of a percent. Dollar softness coming to play there. The pound 121, we're going to be hearing from the BOE governor, Andrew Bailey, in the next 30 minutes or so. Currently upside of four tenths of a percent for sterling. And Brent trading at $85 a barrel. Further gains, of course, in oil. But you're also seeing copper and iron ore jumping as well today in the session. Gains of two tenths of a percent. And again, a reminder, Goldman Sachs sees more than $100 per barrel by the second half of this year. Let's move it on and, and see how some of these corporate stories are playing out. And the standard charter scoop coming through from Bloomberg. Yes, First Abu Dhabi Bank are looking behind the scenes to revive their bid after it was sidelined because of the regulatory nature that is at play here in the UK. But they are working on a potential additional deal. And you can see gains of 8.5%. Tom Metcalf of our team there breaking down why that could make sense for FAB. Credit Suisse, very different story. Francine Lacroix, of course, on the ground in Zurich, speaking to the CEO. The stock down 4%. Pretty dismal in terms of the substantial losses that they see for 2023. Siemens, though, posting a very solid set of earnings. The more than 100 billion euro order backlog being really supportive for this conglomerate and upgrading in terms of their outlook and their forecast for 2023. Investors rewarding them for that, currently up more than 7% uh, for Siemens. Now, Chief Executive uh, of uh, Credit Suisse, of course, Olaf Kroner, has been speaking, as I mentioned to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix, about what the bank is doing to turn this grim picture around. The results are unacceptable, obviously, and uh, that's why we created a new strategy, transformation program, which we, as you know, communicated end of October to create a new Credit Suisse, much more focused, simpler, built around client needs, in the midterm very profitable, and we are executing at pace. And let me also say we are confirming all our targets we gave by yeah. the end of October. So when do you think results will be acceptable? When will they be at a, a level that you're comfortable with? Look, we said this is a three-year three -year transformation. We gave targets on, on return on tangible equity. As you know, we reconfirmed them. So it will take some time, 2023, certainly a very transformative year. And then we get better and better. What's your outlook for asset flows? So we have seen what has happened in October. Um, let me say that you know the outflows we have seen basically are more than 85 percent stemming from October and November. And if you click only in October, it's more than 60 percent. So what we did immediately after we could communicate end of October, we put in place an at least what the colleagues me, tell me an unprecedented mm -hmm. client outreach program. So we talked in the meantime to more than 10,000 wealth management clients, individual as we talk, and more than 50,000 clients in Switzerland. And I think that has created very good momentum. So if I look into January, the group overall is net positive uh, on deposits, yeah. wealth management globally as well, wealth management Asia PAC as well, wealth management Asia PAC being positive on net new assets, and Switzerland as well. So I think the situation has changed completely. So is this a trend that you believe will definitely continue? And where are these inflows coming from? They are coming from different, different geographies, different places in the firm. As I said, Asia very positive, okay. Switzerland positive in terms of net new assets, other areas as well. So I think it's, it's a really completely changed situation. When will Credit Suisse be reliably profit again? Look, that is a far-reaching 
far-reaching uh, question. We said very clearly we will make a loss in 2023, and from there on um, we will get better and better. There was talk about you delaying compensation or doing it in three transfers. What is the reasoning behind that? No, we, we, we are not doing it in three tranches. So we have we have an, had a big, you know, so to say, compensation day like the day before yesterday. And there were very small parts of the firm, particularly uh, seniors in CSFB, where it was delayed a bit. But, you know, we are, we are doing that over the next couple of days. But overall, it was done globally more or less at the same day. So what's your strategy on compensation and bonuses? Look, the, the strategy in quotation marks is, is, is pretty simple. It needs to be in line with the results, more or less. Um, and, and I think that's the current thinking and the, and the future thinking. And I think that is also something which is very important. You know, if you think about new Credit Suisse, that pr provides us with the opportunity to create an, also a new culture. That, of course, was the CEO of Credit Suisse, Ulrich Kerner, speaking to Francine Lacroix, who joins us now from Zurich. Francine, the stock is down about 4% so far in the session. It was another very tough quarter, of course, as you walk through there with the CEO. How do they hope to turn this bank around? Well, this is a million dollar question, Tom. So on many metrics, first of all, the chief executive was actually pretty blunt. He was quite humble. He said, look, these are horrific results. How he turns it around will depend on execution. Now, what he's done so far, and remember, he's only been in the job for six months. So he's managed to get this deal with Michael Klein. He'll take care of the investment bank. They're paying him $175 million to do so. He wouldn't tell me if they had more anchor investors, but certainly he said, look, once we are, are done in doing this deal with Michael Klein, we can look at other potential, if not deals, certainly tie-ups. The other thing they did is they sold, as we had been told, the SPG uh, to Apollo. So Apollo takes the credit. What they're left with is wealth. They need to grow the wealth. So the biggest concern today, and it's clear when you speak to analysts, it's clear when you speak to investors, is that they have not managed to stop the outflows. Remember, these were horrific. They started in October. We thought we'd be in a better place. And so now it's just how they get clients to put more money. Once we start to see inflows back and those being reliable and a good trend, that's how the business gets turned around. Yeah, absolutely. They have to stem the bleeding, don't they, in terms of those outflows uh, that they've been seeing. How much time, what is your sense, Francina, how much time investors are actually going to give this executive team to turn things around? Well, so first of all, difficult to say. I mean, one of the things that we've, we've been trying to figure out is, you know, what does this mean for the chief executive? But again, he has actually delivered on quite a lot of metrics. He's done so far what he's had to do. And now it's basically trying to stop the bleeding from the outflows. Now, when I asked him about it, he was talking about an outreach program. This sounds all, you know, nice and fuzzy, but actually I don't 100% know what that means in terms of real client money. They also try and say, look, they haven't actually lost big clients. So it's not that the clients are leaving them is just that they're not putting extra money in. So I imagine it will uh, you know, require a lot of traveling, a lot of trying to get new clients, which is also why we saw a little bit, for example, of um, maybe the, the, the risk or how you onboard new clients means that there's a, a bit more, you take a bit more risk just because you want to make sure that your, your clients come in. Maybe six months, 12 months, let's see if the bleeding mm. of the outflows continue in the next couple of quarters, Tom. Yeah, six to 12 months could be the time frame they're looking at. Really important distinction, as you say, around clients that remain versus those outflows. Thank you, Francine Lacroix, of course, on the ground in Zurich for that CEO interview with Credit Suisse. Coming up, Zelensky's European mission, it continues. Ukraine's president is due in Brussels shortly, where he'll urge EU leaders for more weapons to fight against Russia. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. season is here. Consumers cautious in the UK. Are we being overly optimistic? The pain in earnings has not come yet. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Forecasting a double digit decline in revenue. On the back of record sales. With exclusive expert analysis. Tech this year feels so different. As economies move into slowdowns, earnings are likely to come off. They're going to be really closely watched. The important point is the strength of the core franchises. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie. 
in London. Just checking these markets for you. The benchmark here in Europe up eight tenths of percent. Futures higher in the US. Risk on. Dollar softer. Yields down. The Fed appearing, though, to dig in for a longer inflation fight. Four policymakers speaking at separate events yesterday, delivering a similar message. Interest rates will have to keep moving higher and stay there longer to bring down stubbornly high inflation. We are now joined by Nora Sentivani, who is the Global Economist at JP Morgan. Nora, thank you very much for joining us in the studio. I want to start with the picture that we're seeing form versus what we're hearing from the Fed officials and the inflation picture on the ground in the US and the misalignment some see in terms of the fundamentals versus the market reaction. Explain for us what is happening in terms of this disconnect. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the markets have basically gone to price in rate cuts yeah. towards the end of the year. And clearly, this is not something the Fed is overly comfortable with. It's giving us a message that its inflation fight is not done yet. There's still a job to be done here. It needs to be continuing with rate hikes in the near term and then keeping rates at a high level for much longer than what the market is anticipating. How have you adjusted your view on the terminal rate then? Some within the markets then, you're talking about, yes, there, there is a contingent that still expects cuts, but now you're seeing some within the options markets pricing mm -hmm. in a 6% terminal rate. You take the non-farm payroll data, you take the commentary from the Fed, yeah. you put it all together. Where does that leave you and your view on the terminal rate? Yeah, so what we've done, our US team, we've added another 25 basis point rate hike on the back of the really strong uh, payroll number we got out on Friday. You know, this is telling us that the labor market is not easing in the way that we would have thought it would be easing by now. So we think uh, the Fed will need to hike uh, at least twice more. Mm -hmm. So we've got, um, we added another 25 basis point uh, hike in May. So we have been going, going now to 525 on, on the policy rate. And so the question is whether that will be enough. And so I think the risk thereafter is, well, we just have to see. It's going to be quite data dependent, I think, after that meeting. If inflation starts to fall off, as we are anticipating, and the labor market starts to cool, then it could be the case that just keeping rates at that high level is sufficient to get inflation back down. But I think what we're seeing on the labor market, uh, just the sheer strength of the payroll numbers, the employment gains, the fact that the unemployment rate has fallen to a 53 year yeah. low of 3.4 percent is not making us overly confident that there's enough easing coming in the labor market to deliver that sustained inflation. So we have so, so we have the jobs claims later today but more importantly is the February the 14th data in terms of CPI that's going to derail a lot of people's Valentine's Day plans. We, that the importance of that data point and what it tells us about the trajectory of inflation when we're starting to see evidence that maybe the core part of this or at least the stickier parts of the inflation picture are holding firm. You've got examples of second-hand car sales in the US and the costs there are actually rising. Are we starting to question whether indeed inflation has peaked? No, I don't think we're starting to question that. I think we're still confident that inflation is going to continue to come off. I mean, we've seen a very sharp uh, deceleration in core goods inflation in the U.S. That's gone well ahead of what we've seen in the rest it's of the world. It's got to move to services, though. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have to move to services now, which is the quite sticky mm. component. And especially outside of shelter, we want to be seeing those kind of stickier uh, other core service um, uh, components coming off uh, more strongly. Uh, so I think in the near term, yes, there's a, there's a chance that used car prices maybe don't continue to fall at the same pace, but yeah. that doesn't mean we're not going to get a continued deceleration in inflation. Look, you, you have deep expertise on emerging markets. China, obviously, a big factor there. And you're seeing what's happening with commodity prices today, oil, copper, iron ore, all higher. The inflationary impact of China then, not just on the EM, but on developed markets. Yeah, look, the, the main spillover from China's very strong reopening would really be through the trade channel or through commodity prices. And oil prices would be the first place where we would look for it. We haven't seen that much of an impact overall, like relative to the 7% bounce that we're forecasting now in the first quarter. Oil prices haven't really rebounded much. I think that's partly a function of oil and gas inventories in, in China being quite elevated already. Uh, and also, there's a lot of additional supply coming onto the oil market, mm. right? Russia is normalizing its production. It's going to be up 50%. So, yes, we've already factored in stronger demand from China into our commodity price expectations, but we haven't been inclined to revise higher how, how, our oil price. How, how strong is the uplift for EM from that reopened China? Yeah, so the reopening in China is very strong, but we think that the spillovers to the rest of the world this time around will be a little bit more moderate than one would expect in a normal 
uh, bounce in China growth of this kind of magnitude that we're seeing right now. And that's mainly because this is a largely consumption-driven rebound in China. It's not being driven by manufacturing or infrastructure investment, the type of um, impulse that would generally be seen to boost uh, things like copper prices, steel prices, you know. Uh, so I think the spillovers to the rest of the world this time around will be somewhat more moderate. We will see spillovers to tourism mm -hmm. in the Asia region. There will be beneficiaries like um, Thailand, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and we're already seeing some of that uh, come through. Uh, but I think because it's largely a consumption-led uh, rebound, yeah. it's just that the main uh, spillovers where you would expect to see China impacting the rest of the world is through trade and through commodities, and those are just they're, not coming they're not, through. They're not resorting to the previous yeah. playbook, are they, in terms of reviving this uh, economy? Exactly. That, that's the, really important. The stimulus measures as well are just not there in the same way. Fiscal no. policy is consolidating. Credit growth is slowing down. Yeah. The credit impulse is quite weak. Nora, really, really fascinating insights. Thanks so much for coming into the studio and talking through EM, but also Fed as well and what's happening across uh, these global economies. Nora Centavani, who is the global economist at JP Morgan. Thank you for your time. Now, coming up, Zelensky's European mission. Ukraine's president is due in the European Parliament shortly, where he'll urge EU leaders for more weapons to fight Russia. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Okay, let's get to the Bloomberg First World News now with Leanne Gerens. Leanne. Good morning, Tom. Thousands of foreign aid workers have arrived in Turkey to help rescue people from under the rubble and deliver urgent supplies to areas hit by this week's twin earthquakes. The death toll has now surpassed 16,000 across Turkey and neighboring Syria in a disaster U.S. President Joe Biden says was one of the worst to hit the region in more than a century. Now, German inflation slowed in January to the lowest level in five months thanks to extra government support for household energy bills. Annual consumer Price growth eased 9.2%, down from 9.6% the previous month and below economists' forecast. The reading was delayed from last week due to processing problems. Shares in Google's owner Alphabet dropped by the most in more than three months after a demonstration of its new artificial intelligence chatbot Bard failed to impress investors. Google has been under pressure since developer OpenAI launched its chat GPT service. Rival Microsoft is investing in that very technology which it is integrating into its Bing search engine. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Tom. Leanne, thank you very much indeed. Now, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has arrived in Brussels where he's expected to press allies for more weapons in the fight against Russia. The EU's Ursula von der Leyen tweeted, Welcome to Brussels, dear Volodymyr Zelensky, the heart of the European family in which Ukraine belongs. We will support Ukraine every step of the way towards our union. Joining me now is Bloomberg's Europe correspondent, of course, Maria Tadeo, on the ground in Brussels for us. Maria, obviously, there's a lot of secrecy involved in this trip. What can we expect, though, from today's meeting? How consequential is it, really? Uh, yes, and finally, the mystery is revealed. The special guest is obviously the Ukrainian president, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. He has landed in Brussels. He was greeted uh, by the head of the top European institutions, the head of the commission, the head of the council, and obviously Emmanuel Macron, because they were on the same plane coming from Paris to Brussels. Now, we are expecting the Ukrainian prime minister now, excuse me, president, to make his way now to the European parliament, and he will make a speech before lawmakers beyond uh, making a speech speech at the European Parliament. Really, the significance of this is that message that he wants to get across to Europeans themselves. It's this idea of stand with Ukraine that needs to continue. There's some fatigue maybe at this point, but the fight continues. And for Ukrainians, the story's not over. The other issue, obviously, is that, or the other big important thing for Ukraine is that out of Brussels, you get media coverage across the European Union. Tom, I've never seen the European Parliament like today. It is a full house. Yep. TVs all over. It really 
really is a media frenzy as we await for Mr. Zelensky to make his way to this uh, European Parliament that you see behind me. Um, yeah, Maria, as you're speaking, we're seeing live pictures there of Mr. Zelensky, of course, uh, the Ukrainian president, on the ground there with camera crews, but also meeting, it seems, lawmakers, officials uh, in Europe. We'll keep on these live pictures, of course. Zelensky was in London yesterday. There was a suggestion from the UK Prime Minister that the UK might be considering providing fighter jets in some form at some time to the Ukrainians. Uh, of course, his message and his speech went down very well with lawmakers here uh, in the UK, in Westminster. Then he went to Paris and met with President Macron. Now, as you can see, arriving at the European Parliament in Brussels, uh, there is uh, Mr Zelensky, of course, the President of Ukraine, uh, in Brussels. Maria today is on the ground for us. She'll keep across this story for us. We'll find out what the ask is from Zelensky and really how much uniformity there is, or division indeed, amongst EU leaders on how much support, how far they want to go in backing the Ukrainians. Coming up, former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, gives us his insights. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. I think these 25 basis point steps allow us to um, both adjust policy based on the new information and, and what's going on and get us to, to our goal uh, as we need to. There's not yet much evidence in my judgment that the rate hikes that we've done so far are having much effect on the labor market. We are seeing that effort begin to pay off, but we have farther to go. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Zelensky's European tour. The Ukrainian leader is in Brussels, the final stop on a whirlwind trip where he's urging allies to provide more weapons for the war with Russia. A warning from Credit Suisse is expecting a substantial loss this year after clients withdraw a record amount of cash. And Disney's dramatic restructuring, Bob Iger hopes to save $5.5 billion by slashing jobs and cutting movie and TV budgets. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. And Kayleigh, certainly market confidence shaken by Fed talk yesterday. Bit of a macro uh, vacuum today, though, as the focus seems to be much more on the micro. Yeah, there's a lot of earnings stories out there that markets are continuing to parse through, Anna. And I would note that Asia didn't follow the U.S. down uh, in the overnight session. It actually was broadly an update. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index higher by around half of 1%. Really leading the charge was Hong Kong and specifically technology stocks listed there. The Hang Seng Tech Index up more than 3% on the day. So a pretty strong day for risk appetite overall. That is if you are not looking at Adani Group companies. After a multi-day rebound, we once again are seeing these names returning to losses today. The flagship Adani Enterprises index down about a er, stock rather down about 11 percent. Granted, that is off of session lows. It was down as much as 20 percent at one point. The issue here being MSCI saying it is reviewing the amount of shares of these companies that are freely available to trade. So but the potential outcome of that review making investors uh, nervous, perhaps that there is a risk that they could get delisted from MSCI indexes and that could put even more downside pressure on these stocks. Then separately to that, you also had Total uh, overnight saying that it is putting on hold its plans for a multi-billion dollar uh, plan to make green hydrogen with Adani Group. So that is weighing on stocks like Adani Green Energy as well, which is down about 5% uh, in the Indian trade map. All right, well, we're looking at U.S. futures that are gaining after the drops that we saw yesterday. Pretty substantially, nine-tenths percent gain right now on futures. Uh, maybe a little bit of optimism because we have a jobless number out today, a jobless claims number out today, and uh, no Fed speakers again until tomorrow that I saw. So um, that could cheer up markets a little bit. Ten-year yield coming down as investors buying that debt, but it's still back under 360 right now at 359.37. The U.S. dollar index is coming down as well, about four-tenths of one percent, and this allows uh, a little bit of a tailwind for risk assets like stocks as well. I was looking at, you know, not a lot of movement in Bitcoin, not a lot of movement in oil. I pulled up iron ore instead. We're seeing gains in iron ore and copper this morning on optimism. Really, it's a Chinese story, right, that um, COVID cases, uh, severe cases and deaths have fallen significantly since their peaks in January. Plus, there's optimism that um, we could get more stimulus out of the Chinese uh, central government. And then um, there's disruption at mines in Peru um, that are put, helping to push up the copper price. But iron ore was a bigger gainer, so I put it here up 2.2%. Anna, what do you see in Europe? 
Yeah, we see a lot of optimism in Europe here, Matt. We see green across the European map, essentially. We've got stocks going higher, uh, in particular the German market up by 1.3%, the CAC Caron up by 1.2%. And, and a little while earlier, m nearly all sectors in positive territory here for Europe. And it is really a focus on earnings. It's there I want to go next. We've got Siemens leading the way in Germany. That adds to the uh, strength we're seeing in industrial businesses today, and that's certainly the best-performing sector this morning. The Siemens share price up by 8.2%. So keep an eye on industrials when we get to the US session, saying all the things that the market's like right now about their business in terms of the margins, in terms of the, the new orders coming in, so analysts responding very well and investors to that story. Credit Suisse, something very different, down by 4.9%. Uh, we've seen a much bigger loss than was anticipated, record outflows from the business, even though uh, the CEO trying to guide that the trajectory for outflows looks better at, at, at this point where we sit right now. We'll hear more, of course, from our colleague Francine Lacroix bringing us highlights from that interview uh, shortly. Stand Chart, Standard Chartered, the Emerging Markets Focus Bank but listed here in London, of course, up again, up by 9.5% this morning. We've previously seen uh, Bloomberg uh, colleagues reporting that there could be bid interest from First Abu Dhabi Bank. That uh, talk is back in the markets today. Our reporting suggesting that uh, First Abu Dhabi are not done. They're still looking to spend some of those uh, petrodollars on some acquisitions, and it seems that they could have their eyes on Standard Chartered. The project uh, is, is, is an interesting one, so we'll keep an eye on that. And this is what we have on the central banks today. We've got the uh, Swedish uh, Krona very much in focus. We see a jump in the Swedish Krona. This is the dollar falling against it, of course. And this on the back of a new guy in charge at the Riksbank, and he's changing things a little bit in terms of, yes, he's hiked interest rates. That was expected also taking charge on the balance sheet though uh, looking to normalize that a little bit and saying that they want to see uh, some movement in the currency so the market is responding to that Matt. yeah actually selling bonds not just letting them roll off the balance sheet with maturity so very interesting story that caught my eye as well let's get over to brussels though right now where ukrainian president vladimir Zelensky is set to address eu lawmakers um, he has been, well, you can see him sitting uh, down there in his black sweatshirt. Uh, he has uh, been making his rounds around Europe and uh, obviously a push for continued support. Let's go to our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, at the EU Parliament. So, Maria, what do we expect from Zelensky today? Uh, well, Matt, first of all, the mystery has been revealed. Volodymyr Zelensky is here in Brussels. There had been speculation for days as to whether or not he would make this trip. Obviously, he has. We now see him about to address the European uh, Parliament. A lot of this comes after a visit to the UK. He was in London, then he went off to Paris. He met with the French president and the German chancellor, Olaf Scholz. Now, Matt, there's a number of reasons as to why he's doing this now. Of course, we're approaching to the one-year mark of the invasion. He wants to send a message to Europeans that the war continues. There is no fatigue for Ukraine because the fight is still on. And then the other one is just the practicalities of this. Uh, Matt, for an international audience, you should know that in Brussels, you have the biggest foreign delegations when it comes to the media. So he knows that by coming here and taking this meeting today, he will be across all TVs, all of the media, print, paper, tomorrow, across the European Union. So if this is about getting the message across, Brussels is the place to do it. Maria, we saw him, as you said, he was in the UK yesterday saying, thank you for the tea, now give me the aircraft. Uh, what kind of messaging, what are we expecting to hear from him today in Brussels? Look, we're probably going to hear uh, the same. Now, the debate over the offensive, defensive weapons has or seems to have settled on the tanks. The debate is now moving on clearly to the planes. That's where Ukraine would want at this point. And it comes down to two issues. First of all, the Ukrainians say that they expect, quote, uh, Vladimir Putin to take some revenge around February 24th, coinciding with uh, the invasion. And then secondly, they do worry about this idea of the spring offensive, Russia regrouping and retraining more troops and what could be a severe escalation in this. The message is we need weapons where we're essentially fighting on equal terms, but also the sooner the better, because the war, as I said before, continues for them. The story has not gone away, and they fear, if anything, that it could go in crescendo in the next few weeks. All right, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Thank you so much. We now see President Zelensky at the podium making his address to the European Parliament. We will bring you any headlines from those remarks. Meanwhile, in earnings-related headlines, Credit Suisse warns it faces a substantial loss this year after clients withdrew a record $120 billion in funds in the fourth quarter. The bank's CEO spoke with Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua in Zurich. The results are unacceptable, obviously, and uh, that's why we created a new strategy transformation program which we as you know communicated end of october 
to create a new Credit Suisse, much more focused, simpler, built around client needs, in the midterm very profitable, and we are executing at pace. And Francine Lacqua joins us now live from Zurich after that conversation. So Francine, it was another one, another tough quarter. How does he turn this bank around? Well, it's tough to see, and good morning, Kaylee. There's just nothing good in these earnings. Now, I think the main concern, and a lot of it was telegraphed, and he has actually strategically got a lot done, but I think the main concern is the fact that they're only left with wealth, with the wealth management, because they managed uh, to do this you know, investment boutique with Michael Klein. They're paying him on some, $175 million because they've managed to push off the STG, for example, to Apollo. So if you're left with wealth management and you cannot get ahead of the outflows, that is going to make investors of course very very nervous so how he gets ahead of it is actually stopping the bleeding in the wealth management this is harder than it sounds because they haven't managed so far now I did try to press him on what exactly outflows and what kind of assets he's looking at and he has been looking at since January he says look it's not getting bad it's not getting worse but he didn't really have that optimism that maybe investors would have wanted if you look at the numbers they're just ugly but again we weren't expecting a huge deal I think a lot of investors just weren't expecting them in terms of the outflows to be as bad as they were today. Yeah, and he didn't quantify what he's looking at right now, Francine. Fantastic interview. I saw you pressing him on when they're going to make a profit. Not in 2023, he said, um, but he wasn't willing to repeat a forecast that they'll even make a profit in 2024. Mm -hmm. How much time are investors already beaten down um, and tired willing to give him? Yeah, so I tried to ask him really about the reliable profit, right? So this is not just going green, Matt, and good morning, but, you know, the idea that they've turned a corner and they start growing. And he was, again, very shy. Now, I found it refreshing to speak to the chief executive, first of all, who was quite humble, who speaks like it is. He said, look, these were actually appalling results. The time that investors will give him, again, is, uh, you know, how much time he takes for executing. As long as he stays on track and at least shows some sign of improvement, both on the outflows, but also on anchor investors for the investment bank. You know, maybe investors are willing to, to give him a shot. But I guess the question is, do you want to own Credit Suisse at these kind of levels, given the outflows, or do you go for a rival bank right now? Okay, Francine, thanks very much. Bluebeck's Francine Lacroix in Zurich with highlights, of course, from her interview with the management there. Now, Disney shares are up after CEO Bob Iger announced plans for a dramatic restructuring of the world's largest entertainment company. The plan includes 7,000 job cuts and $5.5 billion worth of cost savings. We are going to take a really hard look at the cost for everything that we make, both across television and film, uh, because things in, in a very competitive world have just simply gotten more expensive. Uh, and that's something that is uh, already underway here. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us now with more. And, and Danny, it's a, something we've seen quite a lot from the tech sector, yeah. this in the media tech space. We're now seeing job losses being announced by, uh, by Disney. Right. And to some degree, it's just because rates are higher. The economy is more difficult. The macro picture is more difficult. Growth at any cost doesn't work anymore. And that's something Disney had tried, ironically, because of an activist investor some years ago. So here we have a clear shift, which, again, this time is also prompted by an activist investor. You have Iger coming back. And all of these cuts are about extracting profitability, extracting profitability from streaming. They're going to cut about $3 billion worth of spending in their budget for movies and TV. They're going to reorg three separate businesses. The goal there to improve profit margins. So uh, uh, they are taking uh, a, a lot of credit, or Nelson Pelz, I should say, is taking a lot of credit for some of this yeah. message. Um, do they deserve it? Well, look, they, they are getting a lot of pressure from Pelts, and in part of their strategy of trying to fend him off are the changes they're making. So in a roundabout way, yeah, he's had an impact. Uh, we heard that the spokesperson in an email statement to Bloomberg said, we are pleased Disney is listening. So to your point, Matt, of them taking credit for it. But Pelts wants more. He wants a seat on the board. There's an April 3rd meeting for Disney. That's when he's going to try to go after it. And for what it's worth, Iger did address some of Pelts's concerns head on, specifically restoring dividends. He said that they would try to do it at the end of the year. So that pretty much is uh, them saying, yes, we are listening. We're trying to make some of these changes.
All right, and Disney's up 6.5% in pre-market trading. Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you so much. Now let's take a quick look at some other stocks on the move in pre-market trading that are earnings related, including Robinhood. It did post a wider than expected loss. Revenue missed expectations, but the stock is up about 5%. There may be a few factors in that, including that the CEO, Vlad Tenev, as well as the company's other co-founder, are giving up $500 million in stock-based compensation for themselves. Also, they want to buy back that 7% stake that was acquired by the fallen Sam Bankman Freed uh, last year, fallen from grace as uh, the founder of FTX, rather. He, of course, is still awaiting a verdict in those charge uh, fraud charges. Other stocks related to earnings that we should keep an eye on, a few casino operators, including MGM Resorts and Wynn Resorts, both topped expectations thanks to a rebound in Macau with China reopening. They're each up in the ballpark of 6% before the bell. But one stock moving lower after earnings is Mattel, the toy maker. They make Hot Wheels and Barbies. Didn't have a great holiday period. It was slower growth than expected. Plus, the full year forecast for this year came up short of expectations. So that stock is down 10% in early trading, Anna. Okay, Kaylee, coming up on the program, we are going to be speaking to the, C the deputy CEO of Credit Agricole. Jerome Grive is going to join us. We'll talk earnings with him, of course. Net profit revenue, CIB revenue, all coming in better than had been expected. We'll talk about uh, the, uh, the year ahead. What does he see for the French economy and for Europe? And a quick reminder that we are, of course, uh, monitoring the speech that President Zelensky, Ukraine Zelensky, is giving in Brussels. He's going to be meeting with European leaders. He's currently addressing the European Parliament. And we continue to monitor this speech and bring, will bring you any headlines. Of course, he's been calling for uh, jets. That's what he wants this time around. He called for that in London. He's probably calling for it there in Brussels. Uh, more on that shortly. This is Mingbeck. Personnel, policemen, teachers, professors, scientists, dear doctors, drivers, dear workers of seaports, farmers, dear industrialists, dear workers at the industrial enterprise, dear business owners, small, big businesses, dear workers at banks, dear energy workers and... This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Shares of Credit Agricole are rising after the company reported better than expected earnings. The Paris-based lender outperformed in investment banking and avoided a spike in bad loans in the fourth quarter. Joining us now to discuss the numbers and the outlook, Jérôme Grivet, Deputy CEO at Credit Agricole. Jérôme, very nice to have you with us here in London, no less. Let me ask you about the performance then. If you look back at the performance of the fourth quarter mm. last year, you must be pleased that you've beaten estimates on net profit, revenue, investment banking. Uh, what stands out for you as a real highlight? Well, actually, it's a performance that has been uh, reached with a, a very good uh, activity, very good level of activity in all our businesses. And so it's a, it's a performance that is spread across all our business lines. That is very satisfying because it proves the, the strength of the model. Mm, OK, and in, top, in terms of the strength of the model, I was looking at operating expenditure down by 4%. Tell me how that is possible in an inflationary environment. Well, actually, we've been uh, uh, taking some, some uh, uh, hits in terms of uh, costs uh, in the second and third quarter, and now we are in a mode, in a more, I would say, uh, uh, recurrent uh, mode. Uh, and of course, we'll have to deal with inflation going forward, as long as inflation is is here in Europe. But it's it's uh, 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 something that we, we we are used to 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 get along with. Okay, Matt. I wonder about loan loss reserves. I'm always watching this, Jerome, when banks come out with earnings and you booked $443 million in loan loss reserves, which was less than the average estimate. Why um, not go higher, especially when you have such fantastic earnings, um, considering the uncertainty ahead, considering the warnings from the ECB, et cetera? Well, we have a quality which is very good in our loan portfolios. And actually, we don't need to build up further additional reserves considering the very good quality of our loan books. And actually, we've continued this year again to build up not only what we call S3 reserves, i.e. Uh, reserves covering uh, uh, non-performing loans, but we've continued to uh, uh, build up our S1 and S2 provisions, i.e. provisions covering sound loans. And so we don't need to go further uh, 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 in this direction. And, and we did really prudent, uh, uh, we were really prudent this year again. 
Jerome, I covered European banks for the years of zero and negative interest rate policy. Um, most CEOs were not terribly pleased with that, um, especially the effect on net interest margins, et cetera. What's it like in this new regime operating a bank in Europe? How do you benefit from rising, the rising rate environment? Well, actually, the role of a bank is to make the intermediary between uh, lenders, uh, between borrowers and savers. And actually, uh, uh, what we have to deal with is the capacity of adjusting the cost of our, uh, uh, the loans that we grant to our customers and the cost of the liabilities, liabilities that we collect with our clients. And to a certain extent, it's the same if uh, rates are low or if rates are high. What is important for us is the ability to, to, to continue to preserve a, a sufficient margin between mm -hmm. the cost of our liabilities and the, 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 the yield on our loans. And, okay, of course, but... the transition are difficult, but we are dealing with this transition since now six months or nine months, and we expect to be able to, to go along the same way uh, uh, over 2023. Well, Jerome, of course, higher interest rates do have a cost in that they constrain growth in theory. How are you viewing the prospects of a recession in Europe? Well, two or three months ago, the prospects were really dull in Europe, and the matter was not uh, whether there, were, there was going to be a recession, but when, how fast, and how deep. And now uh, prospects are improving quite significantly, actually, and it seems that it's going to be possible for Europe and for the Eurozone to avoid a recession, even a technical recession. Of course, there is a slowdown in the economy, but there is n less fears of a recession. And so this is leading also to this improvement in the quality of the loan book and to mm. the improvement of our prospects. And, of course, there's some strength in the labor market as well that factors into it. On the subject of labor, Jerome, and your employees at Credit Agricole, what's their bonus pool going to look like? Well, we, uh, we are having bonus pools that are differentiated uh, uh, in the different business lines. Uh, uh, we have provisioned what was needed to reward the very good performances in the business lines that perform the most. And we have provisioned what is needed to cover lower or weaker performances in other business lines. There is no, uh, uh, I would say, policy across the board, but permanently the capacity of rewarding fairly the performances of our uh, 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 workers of our employees. Mm. As Jerome, thinking about the way people are rewarded, uh, uh, there's been plenty of strike activity here in the UK, plenty of, across many sectors. Over in France, we've just started to see a bit more strike activity as well, and in particular around pension reforms. Yeah. Uh, are you thinking about how this impacts on the French economy, the sort of longer term implications of this kind well, of policy? Well, it, it fully depends on, on the, 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 the further development of those movements. For the time being, what we see is that uh, uh, the, 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 the legislative process is going uh, its way and it should be completed by end of March. What we are seeing is that there is kind of a weakening of the strike uh, and, and the demonstrations uh, 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 since the beginning of the movement. So we expect that this is not going to modify too much the prospects I was referring to earlier. All right, Jerome, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. That was Jerome Grive of Credit Agricole. Now let's keep you up to date with news from around the world. Here's the first word. The death toll has now gone over 16,000 from the earthquakes that struck Turkey and Syria. Rescue crews were still finding survivors more than three days after the quakes hit. Meanwhile, the U.S. has deployed an aircraft carrier to the region to provide assistance. President Biden denies that relations with China have suffered a serious blow after the U.S. shot down that alleged Chinese spy balloon. The president told PBS that he has told Xi Jinping that the U.S. is going to fully compete with China, but isn't looking for conflict. He says the U.S. is recovering major pieces of the balloon's wreckage to analyze the equipment. Elon Musk is promising fixes after Twitter users from the U.S. to Asia weren't unable to tweet, follow new accounts, or check messages. It was one of the higher profile outages since Musk bought the platform and fired half of its staff. Many of those who left Twitter worked on core infrastructure projects that helped keep the site operational. And the odds that Microsoft will be able to complete its $69 billion takeover of Activision Blizzard are dwindling. 
The UK's antitrust regulator is the latest to challenge the deal. The agency says the deal could harm competition in the UK gaming market, and Microsoft will need to offer remedies to receive approval. And of course, Matt, that is just one of the reasons Microsoft has been in the headlines over recent days. They also uh, announced a ramping up of their open AI uh, investment and that software bringing it to the Bing search engine, which frankly I forgot was still a thing because everybody uses Google, but that's what this is really about. It's competing and everybody is racing to introduce this AI chatbot technology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, AI is um, what the headlines are all about right now and everyone, especially in media, is trying to get yeah. ChatGPT to do his or her job and then the whole story is how it can't. <laughs> but for me, um, the possibility of stripping Activision Blizzard of Call of Duty is the much more dramatic headline of the day. God. It's one of the greatest video game franchises of all time and it will hurt if it, um, it declines at all yeah. in terms of quality. I was going to talk about AI and chatbots, but Matt seems determined <laughs> to take us back to gaming, so we'll leave the conversation there. Coming up, we will speak uh, with a Spider ETF specialist at State Street Global Advisors. We'll get that perspective on the market so far up this year and what lies in store. This is Maybank. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Zelensky's European tour. The Ukrainian leader is in Brussels, the final stop on a whirlwind trip where he's urging allies to provide more weapons for the war with Russia. A warning from Credit Suisse. It's expecting a substantial loss this year after clients withdrew a record amount of cash. And Disney's dramatic restructuring. Bob Iger hopes to save $5.5 billion by slashing jobs and cutting movie and TV budgets. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, we're seeing some uh, corporate earnings coming through, driving expectations higher. Not for all of the 100% positive reasons, as you see in the case of Disney. Yes, it's about cutting costs, and some of that involves job cuts, of course. And the market seems to want to respond positively to that, just as it did with the tech stories that were similar. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the market is grasping on to anything it can to basically fight the Fed and, you know, the, the earnings outlook for the year. I thought Lisa Shallot's message um, uh, was, was very interesting from Morgan Stanley when she said, you know, there's a huge disconnect between the market and the economic outlook, certainly in terms of the earnings drop that we face and the Fed uh, holding rates at a higher level. No Fed speakers today. We had them yesterday reminding us of what they're going to do. So we had a more than 1% drop and their Fed speakers tomorrow. So maybe you can expect uh, us to be in the red tomorrow as well. Today, a little bit of reprieve for those uh, market participants who just don't want to believe it looks like what's going to happen. Eight tenths of a percent the gain on futures right now. And they're buying treasuries, pushing that yield down to five, nine, eight, one, uh, one eight. So basically, Basically, um, we're looking at a little bit of a tailwind for stocks in a lower yield, slightly, not even two basis points, a little bit of a tailwind for stocks in terms of a lower dollar. The Bloomberg U.S. dollar index coming off uh, now at 1232.87, still, I should point out, relatively high, um, historically speaking. I put in iron ore here um, instead of... Traditionally, I have Bitcoin there, but it's not doing anything as usual. Um, a lot of times I'll put oil there, also not doing very much on either side of the Atlantic. But iron ore and copper are both rising on optimism that the Chinese are going to further stimulate the economy, that the COVID situation is getting better and better there. And this isn't optimism, but there are disruptions at mines in Peru, which limit the supply side of things. And that's, of course, good for the price. So uh, very interesting moves in commodities. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of the pre-market movers? Well, there's some interesting earnings relating mo movers out there, including Disney, which we were just discussing. Five and a half billion dollars of cost cuts plan, including cutting 7,000 jobs. But when a company is focusing more on profitability, investors really seem to like that plan because Disney is up more than 6% before the bell. Also about 6% higher in early hours is Robinhood. Yes, it is suffering from the fact that people are trading less. It posted a wider loss than expected. Revenue came up short, but they do want to buy back that 7% stake that was acquired by Sam Bankman Fried last year. Also, the co-founders of the company are not going to give themselves $500 million in stock rewards. So all of that seems to be adding to the sentiment for the stock this morning. We also have another 6% move in the form uh, of MGM Resorts posted better results than expected. The rebound in Macau really helping that casino operator. And finally, I put Alphabet 
bet on here as well because of course it had its worst day in three months yesterday down about 8% on concerns about the accuracy of its AI chatbot. Yes, have to bring up AI again. It seems to be the world we're living in <laughs> in 2023, Anna, but a little bit of a rebound taking shape for Alphabet up about 1% before the bell. One day we'll do that experiment, Kaylee, get the chatbot to present this program. Let's see. Stocks here of 600 uh, up by 1% this morning. We see this broadly across many sectors. It's an earnings optimism story that seems to be driving things. Weakness in the dollar, perhaps also uh, a driver as well. This is one sector that's in focus, the industrials and Siemens, saying a lot of things this morning that markets like. So the German industrial giant pleasing the market when it came to the numbers they reported, the orders, uh, the margins, all of that being positively received by investors and by analysts. Credit Suisse. Now, this is a, a fascinating story. The, the transformation at Credit Suisse, the ongoing restructuring continues. Uh, we've seen in the midst of all of that, though, a big loss, a bigger than expected loss at Credit Suisse. And also the guidance for this year looks uh, a little worse than perhaps some people had anticipated. And those record outflows really catching uh, the market's attention, just the number of digits in those outflows for a start. And actually, interestingly, the stock is falling and continues to fall more and more. So down by 9.6% now. This is the dollar against the Swedish krona. So the dollar is down 2% against the Swedish Krona. We got an as expected hike in rates from the Riks Bank, but slightly more unexpected. We got some commentary around FX and the balance sheet. They're trying to normalize the balance sheet faster than had been anticipated. They're also talking about wanting some strength back in the Swedish Krona, and that is a change under the relatively new governor at the Riks Bank, Ben Matt. All right, yeah, and I mean, for central banks in general, I think big news if they're actually selling, actively selling bonds rather than just letting them run off. Um, we're going to continue to talk about that surely throughout the day. Joining us now, though, is a, a special guest, especially for ETF fans like me. Vipul Fajdar joins us, a Spider ETF specialist at State Street Global Advisors. Vipul, thanks so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. Uh, let me ask, first of all, about... Um, you know, the incredible growth that ETFs have seen, the, the use case has grown, I think, for ETFs as well in terms of investment. Active is becoming a huge part of it. How do you deal with all of this change at, you know, one of the ETF mainstays, Spiders? Firstly, Matt, thanks for having me here. And absolutely, it's a very exciting time to be in ETFs, and it's been seeing year-on-year -year growth. Last year was a bit of a slowdown in terms of European-listed ETFs, but this year already we've come out of the block flying. Already we've seen $21 billion come into European-listed ETFs. At this rate, we're going to breach that $200 billion mark, and it will be a record year. So the previous record was 2021. And last year we saw $88 billion in. So you can imagine just what a strong start it's been. And just to allude to your point in terms of growth, that just continues in the ETF landscape. Does that continue? Does that growth continue this year? I mean, last year, even as... You know, IPOs were stunted, M&A was down, the market was getting clobbered uh, across asset classes. We still saw continued launches for ETFs and, you know, the growth that you talk about. Is 2023 going to be a similar story? Can we continue at the same level? Absolutely, we can. And we've already seen it in terms of what we've seen in Jan. It's just the nature of that growth changes. For example, ESG ETFs are taking a lot of that growth story. There's a lot of launches in that space. But in terms of year to date, where have we seen the flows? It's been incredible in terms of emerging markets. So emerging markets have already seen, uh, you know, from the sort of 21 billion of inflows we've seen of that, 10 billion or so have gone into European equity ETFs, equity ETFs. And of that, emerging markets have seen about 60% of that flow already. So incredible in terms of that growth from emerging markets. And that's that China story really coming through. Uh, Vipul, good morning to you. Help me understand some of these sector flows a little bit or, or even around the thematics because you say there's a lot of ESG flows but at the same time there's a lot of people getting exposure to energy names because of if they're focused on dividends or share buybacks and those themes that's going to capture a lot of what's happening in the energy space. So where do you see the enthusiasm in that sector? So absolutely. So last year if you saw in terms of factor inflows dividends by far dominated those flows and already this year Dividends, again, in January are being the sort of the leading inflow in terms of factors. We expect that to carry on. Dividends, for instance, last year, if you looked at kind of those companies that paid consistent dividends over 20 years, they outperformed the S&P 500 by approximately 17%. We expect that to continue this year because we're looking at an earnings recession, right? And in that sort of standpoint, these companies that have been able to protect free cash flow, they've been able to protect their margins when inflation has been hitting them. That's the kind of quality we want. So dividends is definitely a place we stick with. But with energy as an example, huge outperformer last year, not the case this year. Instead, this year, everybody's buying last year's losers. Is that going to keep working? 
Absolutely. We've seen that. So last year's losers, all the growth names, they're going up. Energy, healthcare, some of the ones that were a bit more defensive last year are going down. We're a bit more cautious. We prefer to go after where the earnings are. And we've already seen this season in terms of the earnings are being led by energy. The same happened last year as well. So we stick with our core view that energy sector is one to hold. Also, if you look at the supply demand imbalance in the energy sector, you know, you look at U.S. strategic petroleum reserves, they're where they were in the 1980s. These need to be built up. So there's many kind of supply areas within the oil standpoint that are going down and demand continues to ratchet up from China, from the return to aviation. So we stick with our bet on energy despite the weakness relatively this year. OK, and finally, if we could exit equity world and talk about flows and fixed income, what are you seeing there and has it changed at all over the course of the last, say, week post central bank bonanza? So central bank bonanza, obviously, there's been a lot of volatility there. So last week, we obviously had the non-farm numbers and sort of the central banks got a bit more dovish. And this week, we've seen a bit more hawkishness. So it's been quite a volatile ride. But in terms of flows, they've been pretty much focused on one thing, and that's investment grade credit. So last year, it was more in terms of the sovereign space, the safer part of the curve, US treasuries. But this year, investors are trying to take on a little bit more risk in that kind of investment grade part. Um, the US has seen a lot of flows there. But in terms of breaking it down into numbers, pretty much over 50% of all fixed income income ETF flows have gone into IG credit and then a small portion into high yield. Vipul, uh, obviously there are a ton of spiders. I don't know how many ETFs you run, 350 or so. And, um, you know, spies are the oldest. You know, the birthday we've celebrated a number of times over the past few months. Uh, but the market structure seems skewed towards Vanguard and BlackRock still. These, it's like a, a duopoly. Do you see that changing? Yeah, absolutely. There's a number of new entrants coming in, you know, challenging sort of certain areas of the markets like thematic, spiders, particular area of strength is sectors, for example, where the global leader in the sector space. We already talked about the energy sector, but we invest a lot in terms of that research and that part of the. the so there's a place for everyone, Matt, in terms of BlackRock, Vanguard and ourselves and obviously all the new players that are coming in. The, the point is that this whole pie is just growing. And as you alluded to earlier, the active side of things might be sort of shrinking a little bit, but from the ECF side, all we see is it going from strength to strength. Vipul, thanks very much for joining us. Really nice to see you. Vipul Forjadar joining us there from uh, State Street Global Advisors. Coming up, uh, we will be back to the corporate earnings story, Disney's dramatic overhaul, more on the company's plan to cut jobs and save billions of dollars. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with Duke Energy CEO Lynn Good. That's at 10.30 a.m. New York time, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. We will aggressively curate our general entertainment content. We will reassess all markets we have launched in and also determine the right balance between global and local content. We'll adjust our pricing strategy, including a full examination of our promotional strategies. That was Disney CEO Bob Iger speaking on his plans for a dramatic restructuring of the world's largest entertainment company. Reductions include cutting 7,000 jobs and adding $5.5 billion in cost savings. Bloomberg's Alex Webb is joining us now for more. So, Alex, of that $5.5 billion, $3 billion is a sliced budget for TV and movies. I thought content was king. How are we supposed to make sense of this? Well, what we saw a few years ago, at the early in the pandemic, Disney came under pressure from an activist investor, not Nelson Peltz, who was putting pressure on them, on, on them this time, basically to say, be more like Netflix, become a growth stock, cut the dividend, invest the proceeds in Disney+. Plus. They did so, the stock was rewarded. It ended up trading at a multiple similar or above, in fact, where Netflix was at that time. What we've seen over the past few months, of course, is that growth stocks are being punished as interest rates come up. To compound that, we're also seeing a slowing of growth at Disney+, Plus, the, the platform in which they were investing all that capital. So that seems to be what is driving this pivot. They are cutting back on spending on new content, and they are also cutting back. Crucially, if you look at the remaining uh, $2.5 the biggest chunk of that is marketing. If you look within that, 
you suspect a lot of it is going to be about customer acquisition. It costs money to bring people into Disney+. Plus. They're trying to ease away from that. Mm, yes, I wanted to understand what it is that Bob Iger makes of Disney+, Plus. I suppose, given that was so much the theme of the last few years under previous management, and now Bob is back and he is making his mark. Uh, what did we learn from the conference call about how he wants to approach that part of the business? That it isn't the be-all and end-all, essentially. That There have been some talk as well about possibly selling more content to third-party streaming mm. platforms, which is the strategy that Sony has pursued. You know, Sony, one of the biggest film studios in Hollywood, doesn't have its own captive streaming platform, which sometimes you think it might do, given it's got the PlayStation. Instead, what they do is they sell their films to Netflix, HBO Max, and others. And so what we're seeing with Disney is possibly they're going to do more of that. It's about how do we make streaming profitable because mm. at the moment it isn't for very many people at all. It seems to me, Alex, they leave so much money on the table um, by allowing ESPN to kind of support all these random cable providers. You know, even if I buy ESPN Plus um, to stream, I still can't see any of the good games unless I get Verizon um, or Time Warner or any of the other cable packages here, which I'm not going to shell out the money to do. When can I get ESPN, all the games, dedicated streaming on my box? Well, some of that is to do with the complexity of the licensing agreements in terms of what you can show in different parts of the world, whether you get the local games or not. The, com the real world we need to look at here is churn. If you have a cable contract, you might have an 18-month, two-year contract. That means they've locked you in. You are unlikely to come out of that because there will be fees you have to pay. The challenge with the streaming economy is that people can churn out from month to month to month. So you might spend, let's say, $30 in advertising and marketing to acquire a customer. If you lose that customer after two months because they've seen all the games they want to see, they've seen the films they want to see, that means you've made a loss on that. If you spend $30 trying to acquire a customer as Verizon or AT&T, you lock them in for a two-year uh, two contract, you could be looking at upwards of $600 of value generated from that. The economics are therefore quite considerably different, and that's why there is still value in retaining games on, uh, on cable. Mm, Alex, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Alex Webb acting as the analyst and also providing essential media consumption advice to Matt. Miller, which I know is an important feature of the program. Now, in other earnings news, Credit Suisse is extending its fall. The share price is really under pressure today. The bank warns it faces a substantial loss this year after clients withdrew a record $120 billion in funds in the fourth quarter. CEO Ulrich Kerner spoke with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix in Zurich. The results are unacceptable, obviously, and uh, that's why we created a new strategy, transformation program, which we, as you know, communicated end of October to create a new Credit Suisse, much more focused, simpler, built around client needs, in the midterm very profitable, and we are executing at pace. And let me also say we are confirming all our targets we gave by yep. the end of October. So when do you think results will be acceptable? When will they be at a, a level that you're comfortable with? Look, we said this is a three-year three -year transformation. We gave targets on, on return on tangible equity, as you know. We reconfirmed them. So it will take some time, 2023, certainly a very transformative year. Mm -hmm. And then we get better and better. What's your outlook for asset flows? So we have seen what has happened in October. Um, let me say that, you know, the outflows we have seen basically are more than 85% stemming from October and November. And if you click only in October, it's more than 60%. So what we did immediately after we could communicate end of October, we put in place, an, at least what the colleagues me, tell me, an unprecedented mm -hmm. client outreach program. So we talked in the meantime to more than 10,000 wealth management clients, individual, as we talk, and more than 50,000 clients in Switzerland. And I think that has created very good momentum. So if I look into January, the group overall is net positive uh, on deposits, yeah. wealth management globally as well, wealth management Asia PAC as well, wealth management Asia PAC being positive on net new assets, and Switzerland as well. So I think the situation has changed completely. So is this a trend that you believe will definitely continue? And where are these inflows coming from? They are coming from different different geographies, different places in the firm. As I said, Asia very positive, Switzerland positive in terms of net new assets, other areas as well. So I think it's it's a really completely changed situation. When will Credit Suisse be reliably profit again? Look, that is a far-reaching 
far-reaching uh, question. We said very clearly we will make a loss in 2023, and from there on um, we will get better and better. There was talk about you delaying compensation or doing it in three tranches. What is the reasoning behind that? No, we, we, we are not doing it in three tranches. So we have we have an, had a big, you know, so to say, compensation day like the day before yesterday. And there were very small parts of the firm, particularly seniors in CSFB, where it was delayed a bit. But, you know, we are, we are doing that over the next couple of days. But overall, it was done globally more or less at the same day. So what's your strategy on compensation and bonuses? Look, the, the strategy in quotation marks is, is, is pretty simple. It needs to be in line with the results, more or less. Um, and, and I think that's the current thinking and the, and the future thinking. And I think that is also something which is very important. You know, if you think about New Credit Suisse, that pr provides us with the opportunity to create an, also a new culture. The Credit Suisse CEO Ulrich Kerner speaking to our colleague Francine Lacroix a little bit earlier on. Now, coming up on the programme, we will run you through the market moving events that you need to watch out for today. This is Bing Bang. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now let's take a look at what is ahead for today. The Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is in Brussels to attend a summit of EU leaders. We've heard him speaking uh, in, uh, in London yesterday and in Brussels this morning. At 8.30 a.m. Eastern time, we will get U.S. initial jobless claims. We continue our laser focus, of course, on the jobs and the inflation data out of the U.S. At 11.30, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen speaks on development finance at an event in Washington. And earnings season continues, of course. The French cosmetics company L'Oreal uh, will report numbers at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So after the close here in Europe and lift earnings are coming after the bell in the United States. Now, Kaylee, today is a bittersweet day for this program. Um, bitter because Kaylee Lyons is actually leaving the program today, which is a very sad event for Matt and for I. Uh, but it's also sweet because you're going on to much more, uh, well, not much more exciting, other exciting opportunities <laughs> with Bloomberg in Washington. Tell us what you're going to be doing. Yeah, I'll be heading south just about four hours, so I'm not going very far, but I will be still doing the crypto show with Matt, focusing a lot more on regulation and policy and its intersection with financial markets. I'm super excited because it's kind of going home for me. I'll be, oh, guys. Oh, look. Aww. Look what the graphics team did. Oh, very <laughs> sweet. But I am I'm going to miss you guys very much. I, I, I would be lying if I said I've enjoyed waking up at 2 a.m., for the last two mm. years, but you guys made it worth it. Both of you, our amazing production team, everyone in the control room that works behind the scenes. I have so enjoyed working on the show, and I'm going to miss you very much. Matt, I will what say, are we going to do without Kaylee? Um, <laughs> so first of all, for those of you who see us in boxes <laughs> all the time, I just want to point out, <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> I'm right here. We are see? on the same set. So, but uh, you'll be sorely missed here. Yeah. I may actually just come down to Washington, D.C. and tr Well, and try and start a new show there. Because oh, I'm not yeah. sure if I can do this show without you. But we'll see, Excellent. right? Good idea. And also, I, I think if, if anybody can make regulation in Washington sound exciting and accessible, <laughs> then it is Kaylee Lyons. So, so that is good. Right, now, usually at this time of the day, I, I read, uh, I take us out of the hour, but I'm going to let you do that, Kaylee. For oh, this, for the for final edition. time. Very bittersweet indeed. Thank you guys word. for a goodbye. I'm going to <laughs> sign off for early edition for today and for the time being. But thank you guys, as always, for watching. Surveillance is up next. Tom, John, and Lisa will be taking you through all of the action you need to know this morning. We'll be hearing from Jim Zelter, the co-president of Apollo Global, among others. From New York and London, this is Bloomberg.